So if you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. If you have a bulletin and want to follow along with us, number one, our attitude towards others. Our attitude towards others. Point two, our attitude towards worship. Folks, do you realize there are people that come in here every Sunday and don't worship? I'm not criticizing. I'm just telling you the facts. You can go to church and not worship. Okay, so I, I, I love this part of it. Uh, it's all, and again, it's practical. Folks, this is where we live. Uh, just with Amy sharing her heart with you about what you have to do. And the uh, same thing happens to me uh, on Saturday nights. You know, I'm, man, I'm in there. And, uh, and while we're confessing here, uh, I got up this morning and had to apologize to my wife for something I said yesterday. Okay, so we all sin. We all come short of the glory of God. So we need to understand uh, our attitude of our worship can be affected uh, by our personal lives. Number three, our attitude towards sanctification, through sanctification. Let me just start by saying, folks, attitude is everything. Attitude is everything. You know, when we speak of our Christian conduct, we are talking about our Christian behavior, uh, how we talk and our actions. Uh, our goal, the goal of every Christian should be to talk and act like Jesus. He should be our role model, our guide in the person we emulate. Every day of our lives, people are listening to what we say and looking at how we behave. I know, I know nobody is perfect, but we should strive for perfection in our Christian walk. We should treat others the way Jesus treated others. We should be ministers of encouragement to the lost and to the saved world. The Apostle Paul writes about how important our attitudes are in being, attitudes are in relation to others, worship, and being a Christian. May we all be what God wants us to be in this fallen world. Number one, our attitude towards others. Verse 14 of 1 Thessalonians 5. Now, we exhort you, okay? And it's Paul writing, and he is talking to Christians, all right? Christians mainly. And it's not all Christians, because in any church setting, in any assembly, there's a good chance that not everyone in the assembly is saved. So we have to understand it's mainly for those who are saved, but this uh, uh, talks about the lost also. Brethren, Warn those who are unruly, warning others. And again, folks, it's not uh, pointing out someone else's sin, because even when it, we talk about unruly, uh, it could be an immature Christian. It could be somebody that, you know, the Holy Spirit has not spoke to about a certain thing going on in their own lives. And again, you have to understand, being a Christian is not just a bunch of rules. Okay, we have the Ten Commandments. We need to obey the Ten Commandments. But when somebody that gets saved, especially if they don't have a church background, okay, they don't know, you know, uh, exactly all right from wrong. They probably have not studied the Word. And again, it's the Holy Spirit's job to warn them about right and wrong. But another, in the second part, which I think this is probably more than the other, when it says warn those who are unruly, it's talking about warning people that Jesus is coming soon. We don't live like Jesus is coming soon. We don't witness like Jesus is coming soon. There's a lost and dying world out there, and we need to warn uh, uh, immature Christians and especially lost people that Jesus is coming. And again, he's going to throw these short words and these short phrases at us. Second one, comfort the faint-hearted. Okay, the faint-hearted is, is those that have, uh, you know, had a setback. These are those that the situations in life have just kind of uh, wore them down. 
These are people that, you know, they've had uh, tragedies in their life or they've been disappointed by people or they have their eyes on people and not God. And they're wanting to throw in the towel. They're wanting to quit. And folks, we need to understand part of our job is to encourage those who discouraged, who are discouraged. If people that uh, attend here and you don't see them for one or two or three weeks, folks, we need to be on the phone. We need to be calling them. We need to be encouraging them in the faith. If they come to Sunday school and they are normally there and they miss uh, times, okay, we, not just as church leaders, all of us, and folks, you don't know how encouraging it is for people to miss you. And that's what he is saying here. He is saying our attitude towards others is not saying something like, well, where have you been? You've been into the lake for the last five weeks? That is not encouraging, folks. Okay? Hey, hasn't the Lord, you know, hadn't he convicted you about not coming to church? That is not encouraging. Okay? It's, it, 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 it isn't. So we need to encourage the faint-hearted and uphold the weak. And when we think of weak, uh, there's two thoughts there. Uh, Folks, there are people that are fighting battles. My heart just goes out to cancer patients. I am a cancer survivor, folks. All right, I I had uh, two incisions and two skin grafts and radiation on my shoulder. So when I go into a hospital room or if I hear somebody has cancer, there's a special thing that goes up in my mind. Because when you can say, I know what you're going through, that changes everything. And even if you're not going through it, folks, they, you know, health is an issue and and just, just being there, writing a card of encouragement. Folks, I am telling you, radiation burns the fire out of you. I've taken it. I did not have to take chemo, but chemo kills good stuff and bad stuff. So sometimes they're weak, okay? They just physically can't go on. We need to help these people. And here's the key. Look at the next phrase. Be patient with all. I am telling you of the nine gifts of the Spirit, you're going to hear me say this uh, forever and ever. Patience is the last thing we master as Christians. We want it, and we want it now. Now notice the word, with all. Folks, little kids, okay? Little kids, they're not always going to do right. Teenagers, they're not going to do right, okay? We do need to set boundaries. There does need to be discipline. I'm all for that. Okay, but I'm simply saying you could actually beat them down with words and and wound their spirits. So we need to watch that fine line and listen to me. Listen to me, parents. Never discipline when you're angry. Okay, walk away and then later on do the discipline. And by the way, while we're here, time out. Okay, I know some people do time out, but time out, I'm telling you, I never understood the class because I was in there in junior high. It was called detention. When you act up in a class, I never figured it out because all the bad kids go to the same classroom. And what do they do? They act even worse. And some poor teacher has to put up with that. I'm simply saying, don't injure or or hurt your child. And folks, you don't have to smack them to hurt them. Words hurt. Words hurt. So be careful. Be patient with all. Verse 15, see that no one renders evil for evil to anyone. Folks, the American way is, if you, you cross me, then I have every right to cross you. If you curse me, I have every right to curse you. If you talk about me, I have every right to talk about you. That is not what the Bible teaches. It's not. He says, leave it to God. He'll do a better job and probably a longer job. Okay? But always, notice the word, wording here, always pursue what is good, both for yourselves and for all. Folks, God unites, Satan divides, 
We need to help people. We need to be good to people. We need to encourage people. We need to forgive people. Folks, if somebody asks for your forgiveness, you need to forgive. And I know what some, it just went through your mind. You don't know what they did. Folks, you can't qualify that. What Jesus did on the cross, okay? But yet he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. So our attitude towards others is so important. Ephesians, go with me to Ephesians. Just back a few uh, books or chapters. Ephesians 4, verse 25. Ephesians 4, 25. Therefore, put in a way line. Don't lie to anybody, okay? <laughs> when I was a youth minister, I never understood, uh, you know, the, the kid that thought, well, I'm, you know, they'll tell their parent, well, I'm not lying this time. <laughs> well, if you lied once, then you'll probably lie again. Don't lie. There are not little white lies. Sin is sin. Now, the results, okay, the punishment for the big ones, there's more punishment, no doubt. But I'm simply saying, do not lie. Let each of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one to another. Uh, and again, sometimes people ask us what I call loaded questions. Do you like my hair? <laughs> well, you know, if you like it, I like it. It's very becoming. Now, I didn't say what is becoming, all right? All right? But again, you don't have to be ugly about it, okay? Oh, here's the one I hate. Do you think I'm fat? You, you cannot win in that one. The answer is no, okay? There's bigger people than you, all right? And that's what I'm saying. You, you, you can't... Man, I'm losing the crowd. I'm losing it. <laughs> okay, you can't, you can't just bullface lie, but there's other things. Uh, you know, helping them and encouraging them in that is a good thing. All right, let's move on. 26, <laughs> be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. Folks, uh, anger just, it, it hurts. You know, the whole situation uh, when you're in conversation with someone and somebody gets angry or somebody hangs up on you or somebody used to, we'd slam the phone down, but we don't do that anymore. And the, here's the other thing, folks. Because so many people email and they text and do that, they do it when, when they're not in your presence. And there is a different attitude when you can just write anything you want on an email or on a text. The thing I want to warn you about, you can retrieve those texts. Be careful what you write, folks. It may come back to bite you. Don't do things out of anger, okay? It's not good. It's like one couple told me one time, well, we're not angry at each other when we go to bed. We just, uh, she, she turns her back on me and I turn my back on us and we go to sleep. And I was like, that's not a good thing to do. Folks, settle the issue uh, uh, before you go to bed. Do not let the sun go down in your life. Do not give place to the devil. Folks, the devil does this. He wants Christians arguing or picking on each other or trying to point out. And again, folks, uh, you know, we all have issues. There's things that, that people do, but you don't have to get angry and, and lose fellowship with other Christians. But rather, let him who still no longer, let him labor with working of his hand what is good, that he may have something uh, to give him who has in need. And folks, I'm, you know, we all, those who are able to work need to work. That's the bottom line. Okay, they need to work. And then there's those who can't. They have a physical or maybe even a mental issue uh, we need to be, it, it's just like having the food, uh, you know, the food pantry, the food closet. Folks, I started that years and years ago, because here's the deal. All right, those kids are not the reason they're hungry. It's the parents, okay? It's the parents. And if we can help those, and I know we get beat by some, 
But folks, I would rather get beat by some than send any, see any child go hungry. I just can't do it, okay? And I don't think Jesus would either. Verse 29, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. Ooh, watch him potty mouse, okay? Folks, we're talking about Christian conduct, all right? Don't use the language of the ignorant. Proceed out of your mouth, but what is good and necessary for edification. Folks, it's just as easy to say something nice about a person than to take him down or to put them down, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit. This is so, so a key, folks. We can't grieve it, all right? We have to give room. We have to let the Holy Spirit work in people's lives and not try to be their conscience. By whom you were sealed the day of redemption. Now here it is. Let all bitterness, wrath, clangor, clamor, and evil speaking of be put away from you with all malice. Folks, none of these things honor God. Be kind to one another. Kind, nice, sweet, spirited, for, uh, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as uh, God in Christ uh, forgave you. Most God forgive you of ev- Can you imagine that? God has forgiven you of ever sin th- in the past. God has forgiven you of the sin that you have to- done today. God is going to forgive you. Now, it doesn't give us license to sin and just say, oh, he's going to forgive me anyway. That is not the attitude you need to have. You need to understand that sin breaks God's heart. But yet we're going to do it if we confess our sins in faithful and just to forgive us of all sins and cleanse us of all righteousness. So our attitude towards others, our conduct towards others is very, very important. Number two, (coughs) our attitude towards worship. Look at verse 16. Rejoice always. I love that, folks. The The joy of the Lord is your strength. We have come here today to worship, to worship just not a place to hang out on Sundays. It's not the place where you see what everybody has on or what someone drives, okay? It's a place of worship. This is not an auditorium. It's a sanctuary. And there is a difference, folks. A sanctuary is where God is, where God is. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. That means be in an attitude of prayer. Okay, when it comes to worship, I hope you have, I mean, even before you got here, I hope that you prayed for this service. I hope you pray for your staff every day. Folks, we need your prayers. Prayer is so important, so important. In everything, give thanks. Give thanks. And sometimes the hardest thing to do is give thanks for something uh, that maybe happened that, that You know, people wouldn't see it as a good thing. But folks, God knows what he's doing. God's timing is always right. We need to give thanks in all things. And that's what he is saying. These three three things we need to do. We need to be joyful. We need to be prayerful. We need to be thankful. Why? For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. The will of God, man. You should want to be in the middle of God's will in everything you do. So have joy in your life. Not just happy, happiness. Happiness is happenstance. When things are going good, you're happy. When things are going bad, it shows all over your face. Okay? Joyful, prayerful, and thankful. Verse 19, do not, we're talking about worship, do not quench the Spirit. Oh, folks, if we come in here with attitudes, okay, and I'll never forget it, our parsonage was right by the gymnasium over in Alma, and I would always go over and, you know, we just walked down a stairway and I'd go into the main building of the church, and one Sunday morning, uh, you know, I was behind. These people just were sitting in their car, and they were just, I mean, <laughs> You know, I couldn't hear what was going on, but I just kind of walked by and thought, oh man, this is probably not going to be good. And then, 
when they, when they got out, I was going, hey, Brother Mike, how are you? I said, oh, how are y'all doing? Oh, we're doing great. <laughs> I wanted to say, liar, liar, pants on fire. Okay, folks, we can't bring our weeks, uh, sorrows, our weeks, uh, disappointments, our work, all these things we bring in with us. And folks, it's not good. We are here to worship God, to be filled with the Spirit, and to sense the presence of God. We need to focus on God when we're here. Some folks need to take their watch off. They just need to take them off. Some people need to realize that, man, it's, it, I, I don't even need to think about somebody else when I'm in here. I need God speaking to me. That's what true worship is is. So do not quench the Spirit. Do not despite prophecies. That's the preaching of the Word. Listen, folks, I'm just the messenger boy. I just do what, do what God tells me to do. I mean, even today, you could probably say this, well, that's the second time he was going to start Matthew, and he didn't start Matthew. I'm kind of ticked off about that. I'm going to sit here mad because he didn't start Matthew. Well, talk to God, folks. That's what God told me to do. And again, nobody, I mean, I'm not saying nobody has done that. I'm just saying I'm trying to think like people think sometimes. Okay? You know, let me go on. Verse 21. <laughs> <laughs> test all things. How do we test? Two ways to test. All right? Two ways. What does the Word of God say? What does the Spirit of God say? I'm telling you, I can turn on a TV I can listen to any preacher I want for five minutes or less, and I can tell you whether I need to be listening to this guy or not. He may not say something wrong, but if my spirit doesn't bear witness with his spirit, I need to go to another channel. And again, I'm just talking about TV preachers. They're not all bad. There's some fantastic TV preachers. I'm just giving you an example, and we need to understand. We need to test all things. Uh, folks, uh, the popular, the, you know, a lot of times people think numbers is the problem. Okay, you have a majority and that's, well, you want to, can I remind you about uh, Kadesh Barnea and the children of Israel, the 12 spies? Ten of them says, hey, we can't do this. Two of them said, this is what we need to do. And they wandered around for 40 years because they listened. Listen to me, the majority is not always right, especially if it goes, I mean, always really, if it goes against the Word of God. But we have to check the Word of God. We have to check the Spirit of God. Hold fast to what is good. And here's my life verse. I know those who have been with me know this. Abstain from every form of evil. Folks, we know, if we are Christians, we know right from wrong. And I know temptation is there, and I know it's hard not to do, but folks, we need to... And, and, and evil, we have to say. Folks, we live in an evil world. Oh, my goodness. On television, on the Internet, all these things are just hammering us that are evil, and we don't need to be a part of that. And let's look at Psalm 100. We're talking about praise here. Our attitude of worship. I love this. Make a joyful shout unto the Lord, all ye lands. Psalm 100, serve the Lord with gladness. There's that joy. Come before his presence with singing. And I know some people say, well, I just can't, I can't carry a tune in a bucket. Steve, let's get what I call a bucket choir. Okay? <laughs> all you who say you can't sing, let's get up here. I bet you do, okay? I really do. Why? Because it's not just the sound it's the attitude, and it's the heart. It's the heart. Know that He is Lord and He is God. It is He who has made us and not we ourselves. We are His people and the sheep of His pastors. Look, pasture, enter into His gates with thanksgiving. Oh, folks, we have so much to be thankful for. So much. His courts with praise. Be thankful to Him and bless His name. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting. His truth endures to all generations. Folks, you should be hungry 
for the Word of God. You should come in here with an appetite to worship, with an attitude of worship coming before God. Then the last thing, not only our attitude towards others, not only our attitudes towards worship, our attitudes towards sanctification. You have to understand, I know that's a huge word, but sanctification is just being set apart. Folks, we as Christians should not look like the world. We should not go where the world goes. We should not talk what the world talks. We, our conduct needs to be Christ-like in all we do, and God is in the process of sanctifying us, especially if you're a new Christian. You're a babe in Christ. You're going to learn. Man, just keep coming to church. Uh, keep reading your Bible. Keep praying, and God will mature you. Now, may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. The God of peace. Folks, everyone is looking for peace. And there are a lot of people in this world missing peace because they don't know the Prince of Peace. Folks, one thing this world needs, it needs a whole lot of Jesus. A whole lot of Jesus. They are they're just mad. They're just upset. They are just looking for something to be mad about. And folks, God can give these folks peace, peace in their lives lives. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body, that's everything that you are, everything that you are, be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He didn't say perfection. He, we are not perfect. But folks, I don't want to be an excuse to somebody that is lost. I don't want to discourage a Christian with words I say or things that I do, okay? I, I, I don't want people tripping over me in their walk with Christ. And again, it's not perfection, all right? It's simply saying there, the coming of our Lord. Folks, He's coming. We went through the book of Revelation. It's not going to be long. And He who calls you is faithful, who will also, who will also do it. Folks, my God can do anything. He can do anything. Brethren, pray for us. There we are again. Pray, 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 and then pray some more. Greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. <laughs> it is tradition in some, uh, you know, uh, countries. I'll never forget the first time I went to Alma, and I went to uh, this guy where, where there were preachers. I went to a prayer meeting, and this older gentleman who I had never met in my life, walked up and said, hi, I'm, and then he kissed me on the right side of my cheek and kissed me on the left side. I had never been kissed by a man. <laughs> never. My dad, there is no way, my dad. <laughs> I'm just telling you, there's no way it happened. And what Bob Shelton, Bob Shelton knew what was going on. I looked behind me and he's about to roll in the floor laughing. <laughs> Folks, it was a little uncomfortable. I'm not, I'm not going to, I'm just telling you the truth. But it wasn't wrong is what I'm saying. It's, it's his way of doing things. This was, folks, he was in his, he was like 85 years old. He was a retired preacher. And he just basically said, I wanted to meet one of the new preachers at First Baptist Church of Alma. And again, <laughs> I want to warn you also, watch who you kiss, okay? It better be holy. It better be right, okay? It better be for the right reason. And I really have, folks. Uh, we, we are a hugging church, but when I got here, I was not a big hugger. I'll just tell you that. But I have learned there are people that are going to hug you, and it's just going to happen. So you might as well get used to it, folks. What they are doing, they're saying literally, I love you in the Lord. I love you. When a man puts out his hand, we need to shake his hand. Okay. And again, uh, be careful of how you hug. I'm one of the side huggers. That's the way I think it needs to be. Greet all the brethren with the holy kiss. I charge you by the Lord in this epistle to read all the holy, uh, to read to all the holy brethren. See, back in those days, 
there weren't a lot of copies of the Word of God. I mean, if you got a copy of the Word of God, you were the exception, not the rule itself. We have ten Bibles apiece, nine of them which are in home in our homes, and we're not sure where they're at. We ought to thank God that we have a copy of God's holy Word. We ought to thank God that we can carry a Bible in public. We ought to thank God that we can witness without being persecuted or thrown in jail. That's what he is saying. He said, man, you be proud of who you are. You be proud that you're a Christian. You be proud of the Word of God. And I'm telling you, if I worked in a secular job, I would have the Word of God on my desk. It will be a talking point sometime. Okay? And it says, and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Last one, 1 Thessalonians 4. And I'm, I'm finished. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 1. Verse 13, finally, brethren, we urge and exhort you in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more as just as you receive from how you ought to walk to please God. Folks, when it comes to Christian conduct, we should want to please God, okay? And there's times in life that you're not going to please your family. You're not going to please people that you work with. You're not trying to offend them, but you're standing strong on the Word of God. And for you to know what the commandment, what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus Christ. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. Philippians 1 6, he who began a good work in you, folks, he's working on all of us. We haven't arrived. We aren't super Christians. We don't pull our, you know, our cape off and it says super Christian. We aren't that. But we live in the world. And we need to impact the world. And here it is, that you should abstain from sexual immorality. Folks, it's everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. And even things that are going on. Uh, I was watching a ball game and just flipping through. There was a commercial, and I'm telling you, two girls, smack, one smacked the other right on the lips in a commercial. Folks, that's not how God says it should be. We need to stand. We don't need to judge. We need to let folks know in our voting, in what we do, that this is not right. It is not right. That each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and in honor. And folks, that's the same thing. Okay, if you have sex before marriage, it is fornication. If you have sex after marriage, it is adultery. It is wrong. It is wrong. And we need to stay pure and morally clean. Guys and girls alike, young women, young men, I'm just telling you, you need to save yourself for marriage. The Bible says the marriage bed does not need to be defiled. Father, thank you for this day. And God, I know we covered a lot of ground. And God, I just pray that our Christian conduct would be pleasing to you. God, I pray that we couldn't even be accused of doing wrong things or even saying wrong things. God, I pray that our actions and our conduct would please you in everything that we do. God, it's your church. This is your place of worship. And God, I pray that we would, as we go out into the world, we may even have to apologize to somebody at work tomorrow morning. We may need to go home and apologize to our spouse or to our children. God, I pray that we would all have that attitude of sanctification. I want to be good for Christ's sake. I am a spokesperson for Christ. I am a Christian. I am a follower of Christ. So God, I pray and thank you that you have given us the Word of God and the Spirit of God. So God, if there's folks here that need to be saved, if they just need to invite you into their life, I pray it be so today. If there's Christians that need to rededicate their life to Christ, God, I pray it be so today. God, if there's folks that need to follow you in baptism, 
God, I pray that they would come and present themselves for baptism and even church membership. If they've come very long, they know who we are. They know what we're about. And God, if you say today's the day, God, I pray that they would obey. God, we love you. We thank you. And we thank you most of all for Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Would you stand to your feet? If God has spoken to you in any way, would you come?